This is a grape. Not that exciting, I know. If we remove the skin, a grape is basically just a big bag of the most delicate, spongy matrix, made primarily of cellulose and lignin. In the voids of that spongy network reside the living cells of the grape, and generally, they're pretty tasty. But using a special chemical, we can actually remove all of the cells, and this is what it looks like. Freaky, right? This is known as decellularization, and the process gently removes all the cells while leaving that cellulose sponge behind. It's called a scaffold at this point, and has this ghostly white appearance. You're probably wondering, okay, well, that's weird and looks kind of cool, but why is that interesting? Well, what happens if we were to put some cells back into the sponge? There's no reason it would need to be plant cells. So instead, we could grow some animal cells in a dish and then transfer them to that empty scaffold. They would stick to the scaffold and start growing. So in essence, you could turn a plant into meat. And if you start with a grape, you've basically made a meat berry. Now, it all sounds pretty wild when you frame it like that, but there's method to this madness. You see, the idea to decellularize something actually started with the goal of growing patients replacement organs. As you probably know, there can be very long and deadly wait times to receive a transplant in the case of an emergency or health complication. Mostly because it's just hard to find a match for patients and the supply of donors is low in many areas due to low opt-in rates. What doctors have been trying to do is take a donor organ that isn't necessarily a match but is still a healthy organ and make it match the recipient. They remove all of the cells to leave behind a clean scaffold, and then seed it with either the matching cell type or stem cells taken from a patient. All you need from a patient is a very small tissue sample, and you can grow enough cells to fully reseed a replacement organ. And best of all, unlike current transplants, there's no need for anti-rejection drugs as it's made of a patient's own cells. Progress on the technology is advancing at a remarkable pace. Recently, some groups have made fully functional hearts that beat and pump, and progress towards other organs is catching up quickly. Of course, there's caveats to this. Mainly, you need the donor organs themselves to start with. Even non-matching organs are in short supply. So some groups have looked elsewhere for donors. Pig hearts, for example, are basically exactly the right size and shape to be a match, and various groups have been recellularizing hearts derived from pigs with lots of success but there can be issues with immune response in patients, so they aren't quite ready for use in humans yet. But what about more non-standard tissues? There's more to the body than just the organs. What about things like cartilage or bone? Those would need to be built using a more ground-up approach, but you still need something to grow the cells on. So some groups have turned to plants as donor tissues. If they could be used, they're in exceedingly plentiful supply, have no moral baggage, and cost basically nothing. The first instance of this that I had seen is by Andrew Pelling and his lab at the University of Ottawa. His team used apples as scaffolds and grew human cells on decellularized pieces of apple. To demonstrate the versatility of this technique, he even carved one into the shape of an ear. The goal being to be an implantable structure for facial reconstruction or other areas where you need something solid for the body to repair itself on. His lab has gone on to refine the technique in a series of publications which I've linked to in the description. Using apples like this can be great because you can just carve them into the shape you want, decellularize them, and seed them with a patient's cells, and have an implantable scaffold ready to use fairly quickly to help heal or repair a patient. A far less serious application for this is lab-grown meat. Everyone seems excited about it, but actually making it work is a very technical challenge. One issue is that if you just grow a clump of cells, it never really gets the right texture, and growing lots of little dishes of tiny bits of meat is both very slow and very tedious. If you could just grow the cells on a hunk of the right kind of plant, you could end up with the right texture to make cheap and easy lab-grown meat. Which brings us all the way back to the meat berry. All of that sounds very exciting, but what does it actually look like and how does the process work? That is the point of the meat berry. We get to make a really cool, super weird thing and explore what could well be the technology that either puts food on your table or maybe even saves your life. And this is also going to be a tutorial with everything you need to know to do basic mammalian cell work. We've decellularized a lot of stuff over the years, mostly because it's just neat looking, but also because it's such a cool technology that it seemed worth it to understand it. We've tried a variety of fruit and veg, but of course I even did a whole pig heart, which was a rather laborious process. But this time we wanted to try something new, and we were thinking about what would make a good donor scaffold for our experiment. We eventually settled on peeled grapes for a few reasons. The first being that the grapes we chose were seedless, so unlike other fruit where you've got to work around the seeds, we could just use the whole grape. The second being that the cells in a grape are quite large, and so are both easy to remove and leave lots of room for donor cells. And the final reason being that it's a berry, and I've joked about making a meat berry for years at this point, so I figured it was about time. 
The decellularization process is ridiculously simple for plants, especially compared to animal tissues. All you do is basically soak it in a special type of soap. A cell is basically just a bubble of oil, so that soap makes all the cells pop and then washes away all the debris on the inside. The soap we use is called sodium dodecyl sulfate, or SDS for short. To get things started, we made a 5% SDS solution by mixing 2.5 grams of SDS into 500 milliliters of water, and then just stirred it until it dissolved. SDS is slow to dissolve, so it can take a while, so just be patient. After that, we prepare the grapes by removing the skin, though for our tests we also did one with the skin left on and the core removed just to see how that worked. Hint, not very well. Then just carefully place them into the solution and turn on gentle stirring. We just need the solution to mix without damaging the grapes. As the process progresses and the cellular material is removed from the grape, they'll become progressively more delicate so handling them can be a bit tricky. But after a week or two, you should be left with a fully decellularized grape and they'll look ghostly white. Now, before we can use these for cell culture, we're going to need to do some cleanup. First, we need to get rid of all that soap as it'll damage the cells we're going to try and grow later. So we drain away the SDS solution and replace it with pure distilled water and allow it to sit for a day. After a day, we replace the water with a fresh batch to help draw out the last bit of soap. We use gentle stirring to keep everything mixed and help the soap leave the scaffolds. At this point, the grapes are clean, but not necessarily sterile. We can't autoclave them as we normally would, as they would definitely turn to mush, so we went with chemical sterilization. There's a variety of solutions you could use for this, but we decided that 70% ethanol would be the cheapest and easiest solution. So the grapes were allowed to sit in the ethanol for a day to sterilize them. While this won't be perfect sterilization, our culture media contains antibiotics, so it's sufficient for this experiment. For proper lab-grown meat, the trick is growing the cells without the antibiotics, which can be very challenging and would have added a level of difficulty to this project we thought was unnecessary. After the ethanol soak, they're sterile, but now they're soaked in ethanol, which is toxic to the cells, so it too needs to be removed. At this point, we have to start working in a sterile environment so we don't contaminate the scaffolds before we use them. Normally, this would mean working in a full vertical laminar flow hood. I'm filming this video at my friend Gabriel Lacina's lab, and his hood recently broke, so while he waits on repairs, we're using this filtered air station. It's the same sort of laminar flow device that you would normally use for culturing fungi, but has been upgraded to use a much higher quality HEPA filter that makes sure that only clean, sterile air is blown over the work surface. It took a little practice to get used to working in front of it rather than in a hood, but honestly, I like the freedom it gives you. And we never once had an issue with contamination in all of the projects I filmed while visiting, so I think it works great. After spraying down the work surface with alcohol, I gloved up and loaded all the materials I'd need into the sterile area, making sure to spray them with ethanol first. I've got the grape scaffolds in their alcohol bath, some 50 mil sterile tubes, and some phosphate buffered saline, which we'll be calling PBS from now on. This is a special saline solution that is used for mammalian work that is the go-to for all rinsing and cleaning steps, as it has the right osmotic balance to prevent cells it comes in contact with from exploding. Using a pair of sterile hemostats, the best of the scaffolds were transferred one at a time to one sterile 50 mil tube each. Then, using special serological pipettes, 25 milliliters of PBS was transferred to each tube to allow the ethanol to diffuse out of the scaffolds. These were allowed to sit for two hours at room temp, before the PBS was removed and replaced with fresh PBS. After the second two-hour incubation PBS, it was again removed, but this time it was replaced with culture media. All cells, be them bacteria, plant, or animal in origin, have certain requirements in order to grow. For bacteria, we typically use LB, or lysogeny broth, to provide all the nutrients they need when we grow them. But for animal cells like we'll be using, they have much more stringent requirements and need media tailored to those needs. The media we'll be using is called Dalbico's Modified Eagle Medium, which, disappointingly, does not contain eagles. Normally, we just call this DMEM for short. It's a mix of salts, sugar, and other components needed to keep the cells alive. DMEM on its own isn't actually enough, as animal cells are used to being exposed to a wide range of hormones, cofactors, and other molecules that DMEM alone doesn't contain. So to provide these, a small amount of fetal bovine serum is added to the mixture. FBS, as it's usually called, is exactly what it sounds like, and is the blood plasma from baby cows. I know, gnarly, but it's required for healthy cell growth, and almost all mammalian work uses it. There are totally synthetic alternatives, but they're usually very expensive, and usually don't actually work very well. The one final ingredient is a mixture of penicillin and streptomycin, which are antibiotics that will kill any bacteria that may accidentally end up in the culture media, so the animal cells remain healthy. 
When we grow cells like this, they don't have an immune system, so the antibiotics and good sterile technique are needed to prevent them getting infected and overtaken by some rogue bacteria. After draining away the PBS from the scaffolds, we covered them in 10 milliliters of our DMEM solution and allowed them to sit for a couple of days while we grew our cells elsewhere. Speaking of which, while we were preparing the scaffolds, we were also preparing the cells we planned to grow on them. These are Vero cells, which are a cell line derived from green monkeys, specifically the epithelial cells of their kidneys. Epithelial cells exist all throughout the body and are responsible for holding things together rather than performing specific organ tasks. They're a very popular cell line for a variety of mammalian experiments because they're fast-growing, large, and easy to use to produce a variety of proteins. It's also what Gabriel had in stock at the time. When they're not in use, the cells are stored in liquid nitrogen to keep them viable for many months or even years between use. After retrieving a vial of frozen Vero cells from the liquid nitrogen doer, they were transferred to a water bath set at 37 degrees Celsius. This will rapidly defrost the cells safely so they aren't damaged by the ice slowly melting. We also have some DMEM in the water bath so that the cells are maintained at close to 37 degrees the whole time we're handling them. To get a fresh batch of cells started once everything is nice and warm, all we do is add 10 milliliters of DMEM to the culture flask and then dump in the cells. The flask is then placed in a special incubator to allow them to grow. Unlike the incubator we built in a previous episode, this one is water jacketed to make sure it remains at exactly the right temperature at all times, and has a relatively airtight seal so that the gas concentration on the inside can be changed. You see, animal cells don't actually need much in the way of oxygen. If you think about the cells in your muscles, for example, the only oxygen they get come from what's carried by your red blood cells. But what they do need is a higher concentration of CO2, as that's what they're used to growing in. So the incubator is connected to a CO2 tank and adds an extra 5% CO2 to the air to keep the cells happy. Fresh out of the liquid nitrogen, it can take a little while for the cells to start growing again, so it took a few days before they'd grown enough that we could use them in our experiment. But once they'd filled about 80% of the dish, we were ready to make our meat berries. We call this level of cell growth confluence, and is typically when we harvest cells. Most mammalian cells, and Vero cells especially, are what's called adherent. It means they stick to the flask you grow them in, so to get them off and into a suspension that we can handle, we need to unstick them. To do this, we use an enzyme called trypsin. It breaks the bonds they've built to connect themselves to the dish, and makes them release and start to float around in solution. So when the cells were ready, we removed the DMEM, and then dumped in a pre-measured volume of trypsin into the flask and let it sit for 5-8 to eight minutes until they've all released from the dish. If we left the trypsin in there, it would eventually start to break down the cells themselves, so we have to remove it. After collecting to the trypsin solution with all the cells floating in it, we loaded that solution into a 15 mil tube so that we can spin it down in a centrifuge. This will collect all the cells into a soft pellet at the bottom of the tube so we can remove the liquid and leave the cells behind. After a 10 minute spin at 1500 RPM, the pellet was ready and we could do exactly that. The trypsin solution was removed, and we add 4 milliliters of fresh DMEM to the tube and mix gently to resuspend the cells. At this point, our cells and scaffolds are ready, so we can finally combine them to make the meat berry. We'll be using a 6-well plate as our sort of operating table so we have a clean surface to work on, as contaminating things at this point would suck. To make it easier to handle, our 4 milliliters of cell suspension was added to one of the extra wells, and a grape scaffold was placed in two of the other wells. You can see that after soaking in DMEM, they've turned this characteristic pink. The color of DMEM actually comes from a color-changing indicator mixed in called phenyl red, which will change color to let you know if something is going wrong with your cells. Pink means good, yellow means very bad. Using a normal P1000 pipette, we injected a total of 1 milliliter of cell suspension into each of the scaffolds, to try and distribute the cells into the internal structure of the grape, and not just on the outside surface. Then, the seeded scaffolds were transferred back into their tubes. Any liquid that had spilled out of the scaffolds during seeding, and the remaining 2 milliliters of cell suspension, was split between the two tubes so that we had a combination of cells inside the scaffold and on the outside. Finally, both tubes were topped up with more DMEM to a total of 10 milliliters of volume. Off camera, we made special lids for the tubes that have a filter so that air can get into the tubes and the cells can still breathe, which were sterilized and then added to each tube. Then both tubes were placed into the incubator and allowed to grow. A couple times a day, we'd take the tubes out and roll them gently to mix the liquid and make sure oxygen was getting to all of the cells. And that's basically the whole process of making a meat berry. For animal tissues, the seeding protocol can be a bit more complex, but it's the same basic idea. Normally, they'll attach a tube to some of the vasculature remaining on the tissue and then gently pump the cell suspension solution through it. 
The cells will just sort of settle into their new home throughout the tissue, and if you seed enough of the right kind of cell, you can get a fully functional organ. Because we're dorks, we decided to name the Finnish meat berries Francis and Sylvia. I know Sylvia is spelt wrong, but give her a break. She's only a day old and just isn't very good at spelling yet. After about a week of growing, our meat berries were as done as they were going to get. Ideally, more growing time would have been good, but I was only visiting Gabe's lab for a few weeks and had to get on a plane home, so we had to call it there. We wanted to try and see how the cells had distributed throughout the berry, but this quickly turned into a tricky situation. The meat berry, while slightly firmer than before it was seeded, was still pretty squishable, so our first attempts to cut it with a scalpel didn't really go so well. We tried a mandolin, but it was still pretty mushy, so we couldn't get a good slice. This is why using an apple is a better choice, as the structure is, by default, stronger than a grape. And if we were doing this for real, it probably would have been better to use a firmer tissue to start with. Once we had some pieces to work with, we loaded them into a six-well plate for staining and tried a variety of stains. But when we went to look at them under a microscope, we quickly ran into the issue of it being impossible to tell what we were looking at. There were some areas that looked like there were some cells, but there was just so much debris and weirdness that it's really hard to say conclusively. Unlike when we grow cells on a 2D surface, 3D grown cells have a slightly different morphology. What really would have been good would have been to do immunofluorescent staining, as it would have only stained the cells themselves rather than the cellulose and other debris. But Gape doesn't usually do immunofluorescent stuff, so he didn't have any antibodies at the time. There also could have been lysis issues where the cells weren't happy in their tubes, but because of the amount of grape debris, it was impossible to tell one way or the other. For those wondering, no, we aren't going to eat the meat berries. Personally, I'm allergic to penicillin, so I'm not eating something that's literally been growing in the stuff. But beyond that, they won't really taste like anything. As you can see from the images, there aren't really that many cells present compared to something like a steak, so it would mostly be like eating plain cellulose, which doesn't really taste like anything. That, and there are some concerns with eating raw FBS like this, so for now, these are just a proof of concept. But as the technique continues to evolve and improve, one day, maybe you'll be able to buy a meat berry at the grocery store. Or maybe one day soon, recellularized scaffolds like this could well be the thing that saves your life in the case of an emergency. Before we wrap up, this is actually a great time to talk about the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. While a recellularized heart may save your life in the future one day, you can take steps to protect yourself right now, no cell culture required. For those that don't know, NordVPN is a virtual private network service that protects you while you're online. Think of it kind of like that pen strap we use to keep our cells safe. It's an extra layer of protection between you and those that want to spy on your activity online. Normally, when you connect to a website, especially if you're using free public Wi-Fi, people can spy on your activity, and even if they can't see what you're doing on a website, they can see what websites you're connecting to. But a virtual private network like Nord acts as a middleman. By installing the super easy to use client onto your devices, rather than connecting to a website directly, when you go to use the internet, your traffic is first sent through one of NordVPN's more than 5,000 servers. This way, if anyone is listening in, all they see is you connecting to Nord. From there, you can connect to whatever website you want, and no one can tell who's browsing that website. Now, why is that important? Well, a bunch of reasons. First, general privacy. Our world is becoming increasingly surveillance heavy, so every bit of privacy we can cling to, the better. And who doesn't want peace of mind when reading weird articles at 3 in the morning? Beyond that, another awesome perk is that whatever website you're browsing will think you're located in whatever country the server you're connected to is located in. As a Canadian, sometimes articles or other content is blocked, so if I use a VPN to make it appear that I'm in the US, it unlocks the content for me to view. Best of all, if you click the link in the description or go to nordvpn.org slash thoughtemporium, Nord is giving you 70% off. At only $3.49 a month, it's an absolute steal and comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee and compatibility with most devices and operating systems. And NordVPN both encrypts and doesn't log any of your data, so you're free to browse with peace of mind. So be sure to head over to nordvpn.org slash thoughtemporium or use the coupon code thoughtemporium to get two months free and 70% off and start protecting your privacy online now. To wrap things up, I have to say a huge thank you to my amazing patrons, channel members, and supporters on Ko-fi. While having fantastic sponsors like Nord from time to time is great, it's really your support that keeps these science videos coming, and I can't thank you all enough. Another huge thank you has to be to Gabriel for letting me come and film at the lab, helping me with the project, and doing most of the bench work so that I could work the camera. I've put some links to his various social media pages and website in the description. He's done a lot of amazing work over the years, so I'd highly recommend you check that out. Speaking of which, this was only one of several videos I filmed while visiting Gabe's lab, and if you thought this was nuts, just wait till you see the other videos I've got coming up. 
To make sure you don't miss any of that, be sure to subscribe, and if you enjoyed, then be sure to smash that like button and share the video, as it really helps out the show. If you want to see these projects long before they make it into videos, then be sure to head over to my other social media pages, especially Instagram and Twitter, where I post updates and project snapshots pretty regularly. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.